Hi, I'm Chef Lynn. Welcome to the Flavor Secrets Kitchen and welcome to my guest today, Nadal Daher. Nadal is something that we would all dream of being. He's an expert wine taster and so today our show is all about what wine should you drink with different meals. But first, how about telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, I started in this industry by accident. Uh, I was in school trying to pay for college and I decided to work in a restaurant business to uh, make good money while uh, working less hours. So like many people. Fine dining restaurants, <laughs> exactly. Had to learn about wine in order to uh, work and make money. So I learned about wine and eventually a lot of my friends are surrounded myself by people from the wine industry. And um, from now on, it just uh, it became a career after that. And, so uh, I know you've been in the business for a long time because yes, I remember uh, you from years and years ago when we used to live in Gross Point. Yeah. And I can testify to the fact that you are a true wine expert. But now you have your own company? Yes. Uh, back in, well, I started in the restaurant business and I moved to retail. Um, I was the general manager and fine wine director for the Merchants of Vino. When the Merchants of Vino were sold, I started my own company. It's called... Uh, Sommelier Connections Incorporated okay. uh, have a division DBA Unique Wine Cellars. Okay. And what we do is we have two folds in the business. I have the sales part of the business, which is custom design and build wine cellars okay. and cooling equipment. And then the consulting part of the business, which is uh, training, class training, uh, wine training, uh, industry training like uh, hotels and restaurants, staff, writing wine lists. Uh, uh, wine appraisals, so it has many facets. Uh, okay, so and also wine. Nadal teaches wine uh, pairing or teaches about wine? House. Yeah, I, th I have a wine course that I've been teaching for 21 years at the Ooh. community house uh, uh, in Birmingham and uh, I enjoy doing that. In fact, uh, tomorrow is my first winter class. All right, uh, great. Introduction to Wine Appreciation. Great, and he's also written a book. It's called Romance in the Kitchen. R Romance, Romance begins, begins in, in the, the kitchen. kitchen. I like that idea and I'll look forward to reading it. Great, thanks, you. Okay, let's get started. Um, I've prepared a lot of different things from appetizers to sides to main courses and then we'll end with dessert. And we'll just get Nadal's opinion on what we should drink with these if we're interested in drinking wine. So first of all, I've started out with a simple shrimp cocktail. My definition of an ap a good appetizer is one that women will eat. Mm -hmm. Because if you go to a party, you notice, oh, the women will pass on everything, but not the shrimp because there's only six calories in one of these little things. Okay. So we've got a shrimp cocktail, and then I made some tuna stuffed eggs. Mm -hmm. A lot of people appreciate this because there's no yolk in it. So okay. it's just tuna, shallots, celery, um, a little mayonnaise, a little mustard, and then a little bit of chili sauce. Mm -hmm. And then I put some Spanish smoked pa paprika, paprika. paprika on top mm -hmm. of it. And I made this with Wild Planet albacore tuna because it's pole caught and has very oh, low okay. mercury. So I really like that. Oftentimes when I tell people, um, you have to understand how food and wine works. And the best way to understand how food and wine work is to start by tasting. You know, okay. we always have to taste things. Uh, we can put many theories in front of us and principles of food and wine pairing. But if we don't taste, we don't understand. And mm -hmm. uh, we have to taste the food and taste the wine. And then use that knowledge to kind of put the two together. So when I always like to start a meal and, and, and start with a dinner party, uh, nothing like starting with a sparkling wine. Yeah, okay. And they say, um, you know, there is uh, five reasons why you should have sparkling wines. is to celebrate an occasion mm -hmm. or to actually uh, prelude to a nice evening or dinner party. Mm -hmm. And the three other reasons when you just don't have a reason. You When you don't have <laughs> a reason. reason. You don't need a reason to drink uh, <laughs> sparkling wines. And I, I always prefer to call my uh, favorite Gordon Champagne on sparkling wines, Madame Boulanger, the famous wine uh, yes, champagne maker. Absolutely. Friends. When she was asked, when do you drink champagne? She said, I drink it when I'm alone and I drink it when I have company. <laughs> I triffle with it when I'm hungry and it complements food so well that you have to have it with food. I drink it when I'm sad and I drink it when I'm happy. Otherwise, I never touch the stuff unless, of course, I'm thirsty. So here we go. Okay, so we we're done. We don't have that reason. We yeah. <laughs> we There's don't no need reason you have to treat it all wine. <laughs> when the reason sparkling wine is because it offers a refreshing acidity. This ah. is a, a, a key component in wine that works well with food. Mm -hmm. And they have to, when we say components, there is different components in food and wine that they either work because they're similar mm -hmm. or they either work because they're contrasting. And I'll okay. oftentimes say, how could contrasting things work? Well, often they work. And the only reason we will find out about it is to be able to taste two things and So a out. champagne would contrast with? Well, for example, the acidity contrasts mm -hmm. with fat in there. So any fat in the food, the champagne will cleanse it nicely will work okay. with it. 
by the same token if the food has acidity mm -hmm. the acidity in the wine or the sparkling wine will match that acidity in the food so they cancel each other is there any rule like you your champagne needs to be less acidic than the food or well, more acidic than the food there or? is what we call them principles because if you say rules people are afraid to break them because okay. of rules and in food and wine there is no rules i call them principles well mm -hmm. we do have to match the acidity we do have to make sure that the acidity in the food is not higher than the acidity in the wine mm -hmm. and what happened if that happened then your your wine becomes more uh flat with this flat mm -hmm. and then if you vice versa there's too much acidity overwhelming the food then you wash away the food. Why should we have one go over the other? They're supposed to go together right. in there. Okay. And that's the whole idea in there. And, that, and the only way we'll know is we have to taste. And, okay. then, and that's when we uh, modify food mm -hmm. or modify a wine selection based on what we tasted in the food mm -hmm. and or if we tasted on the wine. So now I'm going to give you something a little bit hard. This is an artichoke, and for people who don't know how to eat an artichoke, you can serve this with butter or with hollandaise. So I'd like you to tell me, would you serve a different one with butter or with hollandaise? But um, basically you just take the leaves off, dip them in, and then scrape that off with your teeth. When the leaves are all gone, then the heart is inside, but it's got a little brush on top of it that you have to scoop off. I mean, it's pretty obvious that you don't want to eat that brush unless you want to choke to death. Is that why they call it a choke? Yep, artichoke. I, because of that brush inside. So just mm -hmm. scoop that off and then you've got the beautiful heart to eat. And then, th I love this plate because it's got room for the leaves. My husband piles them all up neatly and I just kind of throw them all over, but you can do it any way you like. So what would you serve with an artichoke? Uh, let me say something about artichoke. Artichoke hearts is one of the items in food that puzzles foods when it comes to food and wine pairing. And one of the reasons is Artichoke, one of my favorite vegetables, by the way, and um, it has a chemical or component in artichoke that turns a dry wine, gives it a sweet metallic aftertaste. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that something is negative? Because if you are planning to drink a dry wine and you want that to cleanse your palate and that's the taste you prefer, you don't like a metallic sweet aftertaste. Right. But how do we go about uh, going around this? Well, what we can do is the way artichoke has been prepared throughout the years, and the French started this, and so is the Italians, and they mm -hmm. said the Italians are the mother of cuisines, they actually right. taught the French about artichoke A lot of people hearts. don't realize that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's how the whole thing started. Uh, if you notice, the Italians prepare artichoke in a risotto, in a creamy risotto, mm -hmm. to mitigate that uh, acidity in the artichoke. Ah, so uh, the cream. Yeah, okay. and you prepared it in a, a classic idea. French way. Uh, for example, if you have something that coats your tongue with the artichoke, for example, you have uh, butter and eggs, that's a hollandaise sauce, mm -hmm. uh, which coats your tongue, that mitigates also the uh, that taste, acidic taste of the artichoke, makes it work with wine. So, that always prepare the artichoke in a way to work with wine. Now, mm -hmm. is it always a negative? No, because if you take an example of a wine like Chablis, from the Chablis district of Burgundy, which is extremely dry, very astringent, and it lacks no wood. It's mm -hmm. a village style Chablis, so it's not Asian wood, rather stainless steel fermentation. So the wine on its own is very astringent, but when you have it with artichoke, it gives it that sweet aftertaste. It becomes an improvement to the wine. Ah, so we okay. took something that we thought of a negative, we prepared it to become an improvement. You can add acidity to work mm -hmm. with that acidic dry wine. For example, prepare it like Provencal style. Mm -hmm. uh, saute that with garlic, which is my favorite preparation. Uh, or add some. Uh, wine or wine acidic components to the hollandaise yeah, uh, capers uh, lemon. lemon shallots all of that and that brings the acidity component into the wine that works with the acidity of the food they cancel each other so that's Great. that's the component that's gonna have to fight the wine and opposed okay. to the metallic aftertaste that comes from the artichoke. okay so now you know why we serve artichokes with hollandaise sauce there's a reason Okay, and by the way, I prepared that by steaming it for 45 mm -hmm. minutes. That's all you have to do. Just put it on, go take your shower, and come back, and it'll be done. Mm -hmm. Next, I've got another side. This mm -hmm. is a yellow beet salad, mm -hmm. and the reason that I chop the beet up like this into strips is because it cooks in about 10 minutes then. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, it takes a long time to cook beets. And then it's already chopped for my salad, and I've paired this with some, just a little bit of olive oil, mm -hmm. salt and pepper, and this is goat cheese. Okay. The component that I would look, anytime we look at food, I look at the component that's going to pose a challenge to the wine. Okay. And then use that component to pair with wine. And when I look at this dish without even tasting, I know goat cheese. Goat mm -hmm. cheese is that's a strong predominant component in the dish that I need to work it with the wine. 
and nothing prefers goat cheese than a Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc is an mm. excellent complement to goat cheese. And oh, this is a dish, especially because it's gonna be served probably as a salad or mm -hmm. as a side dish in there. You start with a white wine, a Sauvignon Blanc, that could be either a Napa Sauvignon Blanc or a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, mm -hmm. uh, would work really well with this. What if I, I have someone there though who just refuses to drink white wine mm -hmm. and they want a red well so what red would you put with well this? if i would do a red with this i will do a softer red like a mm -hmm. pinot noir from a cool climate pinot noir like a german pinot noirs i know those are not widely available they're very little because most german wines are white produced mm -hmm. uh, but i can also pick um, something like a light carneros pinot noir for example because okay. it's uh, it offers more fruits less than the earthness of the wine mm -hmm. and that's what we look for we look for like a pretty light red wine in fact uh, a wine like a Beaujolais village would oh, also yeah. work with that it's a lighter red okay. uh, I'm trying to eliminate that tannin components in there mm -hmm. uh, from the wine so those are less uh, tannic wines All right, now this is the most complicated thing that I'm going to mm -hmm. give you. This is from the South Beach Diet. They just came out with this new salad, and I'll read it to you because it has a lot of components. It has a medium butternut squash, mm -hmm. two sweet potatoes, a tablespoon of cumin, mm -hmm. two teaspoons of salt, a pinch of paprika, quarter cup of olive oil, and a cup of green lentils in there. Mm. And the lentils you just cook um, in about four times the water. So if you have a cup of lentils, you want four cups of water until they're soft. You just boil them until they're soft. Then it has a dressing on it, which pro also provides a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. A quarter cup of lemon juice, mm -hmm. a half cup of olive oil, half mm -hmm. cup of green onions, like mm -hmm. a scallion. Now they say two teaspoons of salt, but to me, there was already enough salt in that salad, mm -hmm. so I did not put more salt in the dressing. Okay. A little more paprika, half cup of feta cheese, and a half cup of turkey bacon. So oh, this is, oh. has a lot of different things. Which mm -hmm. one would you focus on? Uh, it's very complex. And then when you get to something like that, uh, there's so many ingredients working out in this. Uh, I'll make my wine very simple. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure that the wine is young, that has sufficient acidity to stand mm -hmm. up to the acidic components of mm -hmm. the uh, dish, uh, but also the flavors. You have too many complex flavors in there. So I'll make it very simple. You can either uh, try every time I find it difficult to find a match for the wine, I'll mm. look to Alsace. Ah. And Alsace is a region out of northeast of France that offers wines from the Riesling grapes, similar to Germany, yeah. or the Pinot Gris or the Gewürztraminer. Okay. Uh, especially if I was a younger wine. I stress young because when, I, when wine is young, it offers more acidity. As the wine ages, the acidity softens. The acidity is the main component that's going to work out through all of these richness of the fruit. You know? mm -hmm. So that's why I would use, for example, a Riesling or a Gewürztraminer mm -hmm. from Alsace, a young one that mm -hmm. would work with this as far as white. In a red, again, I have to either reuse uh, an old Garnacha from uh, Spain okay. uh, that offers that fresh fruits with mm -hmm. high alcohol content, mm -hmm. uh, usually between 14 and 15 percent. That would work throughout the dish. And those wines are mm -hmm. amazingly great to work, especially from Catalonia. I right? tend to yeah. like the big reds and I yeah. choose and, them over and the those whites. are the big reds. But here's the difference. We have two things about big reds. We have the typical California big reds which is normally high alcohol and the reason why is because of extra extraction to bring for, fruit forward wine mm -hmm. and as a result it becomes high alcohol and very fruit forward mm -hmm. but that lacks that tannins texture behind it okay. so that's why i say spanish wines because when they use an old garnacha uh those are old vines that although they have high alcohol with the fruit forwards as well but they have that texture yeah okay. that, that we need in there which is the tannins of the that wine makes a lot of sense. Wines. and that's that's and why i say the difference and those are inexpensive choices mm -hmm. um normally between 10 to 20 dollars a bottle and they're, they're, they work really great with this uh, that sounds great food, 10 to yeah. 20 dollars a bottle yeah. actually with this dish if you would taste it you would see that it's heavily cumin yeah. which to me is a problem because i don't yeah. like well, cumin. The cumin I is a strong spice i yeah. apologize to my indian friends Mm -hmm. But to me, the, the cumin is overwhelming and kind of smells like Also, you know, uh, we always have to think, what we think, this is a Mediterranean-style dish, mm -hmm. correct? You think of Mediterranean, we think of Catalonia, it's a Mediterranean region. And in Europe, Absolutely. they made wines to complement their food. 
and we always look at that region. You look at that style of food and look at the wines from that region. They're Absolutely. made to work with food. Yeah, okay. Now this is a bulgur wheat salad that I got from Plum Market. Mm. I have no idea what's in it, so what do we do? It's uh, delicious, actually looks delicious here. I look at the raisins, it's a sweet component. It's mm -hmm. very simple. I think they're, uh, are they raisins or cherries? Uh, there's dried cherries dried or dried, cherries. dried fruits. So there's a okay. component of dried fruits in there. Nuts, um, which are nuts almond? in there, almonds, uh, the great. Um, I mean, it's a simple dish. I will use like a dry rosé, like from Toval uh, in the Southern Rhone Valley. Okay. Uh, that would work, it's a pleasant uh, wine. Okay. Uh, that would work with this, very simple. And now I have another challenge oh, for you. Oh, asparagus. asparagus. So, so another item. Every time, here's what cracks me up. Every time <laughs> we go do one of these dinners and people put, the chefs, you know, get creative and they want to use artichoke and asparagus. Two of my favorite vegetables. And say, oh, no, 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 let's avoid this. Well, those foods are there for a reason. To eat, not mm -hmm. to avoid them in there. So right. what do we do with asparagus? Well, this is simple asparagus. Again, asparagus have a certain chemical that might change certain wines in there. But there is wines that would work really well with this. And I found that if you drizzle the with a little bit of olive oil okay, and add again a little bit of uh, an, a, a acidic components like a little bit of vinegar into okay. it or lemon uh, or lemon okay and people normally so, uh, serve them with um, beef mm -hmm. or lamb well especially if you have tenderloin and you mm -hmm. roast them in there so that way they go along with an earthy meat Oh, okay. great, okay. And uh, as a result, you can work them out with red wine, like your typical red wine. Uh, white wine, I find that Puy Fumé, not to be confused with a Puy Fusé, it's a wine that it's made from 100% Sauvignon Blanc that comes from the Loire Valley of France. Uh, those wines are aged and fermented in oak, so they have an herbal uh, nuances to the wine. Okay, now I've got some asobuco for mm. you, which was our dinner last night, and Love I paired asobuco. it with some just some buttered peas mm -hmm. and this isn't mashed potato this is uh, pureed cauliflower mm. and that's something that again we're, when you're trying to stay away from starches it's a really nice mm -hmm. thing to make all I did is cook the cauliflower puree it add a very small amount of butter and some salt and pepper mm -hmm. and it's done and some people wouldn't even be able to tell that, that it's not mashed potato yeah it looks like mashed potatoes yeah looks great um, asapoco again we look at that traditional it's a European origin Okay. And we look at Italy, there is Italy, Italian asapulco, the Greek asapulco also, mm -hmm. with different Ooh. vegetables when they use the beans, the white, white beans. That's the uh, Greek. The, the Greek style. Asapulco. So when you do asapulco in there, I always prefer to do an earthy wine, uh, such as a Chianti from Tuscany. Ah, okay. Uh, I those for wines sure you would say offer. Uh, you know what? I would not go that route. Uh, sometimes this is uh, they used veal. Uh, mm -hmm. In there, real asapulco shanks in there. So I would um, go with uh, Chianti, or if I want to really be extravagant and be a nice bottle of wine, a nice bottle of Barolo would go really well uh, with this. Uh -huh. That richness of Barolo, the earthness, and the richness mm -hmm. of the dish would work really well with those two wines. And Barolo and comes from? Uh, from Piedmont, Piedmont Italy. Right. Which North is a great region, place to yeah. visit, by the way, because yeah. as opposed to Tuscany, you can see from winery to winery. and it's Yeah, they're close to each other. It's a mountainous region, mostly. Mm -hmm. In uh, Chianti, there is the uh, Tuscany classical region, which is an inner uh, region within Tuscany, and that's mostly mountainous vineyards, so elevated vineyards, and that's yeah. a better quality Chiantis, and those would work really well with us. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to use a Cabernet, we have to be careful. A lot, oftentimes, California Cabernets, because we talked about the high alcohol, the extra extraction, we have mm -hmm. to use what we call an old style Cabernet. Okay. An old world style Cabernet, those are still made in, in California. They resemble the styles of Europe, like Stag's Leap wine cellars make mm -hmm. that style, Chateau Montalina makes that style. Uh -huh. uh, uh, those are what we call the old world style, and, and those would work well with okay, that. Okay, great. Well. And also, uh, one good reason to make asobuco, asobuco means bone in. Mm -hmm. So you have the bone here that's full of some wonderful, delicious mm -hmm. marrow, marrow that yeah. you don't want to forget to eat. You can put that on a piece of baguette, Absolutely. or you can just spoon it right out <coughs> and eat it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I've got some plain old chicken, mm -hmm. and it's got a squash puree. I just cooked the squash mm -hmm. and pureed it, added a little very small amount of butter and a little salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. How about that one? Well, great. When you think of squash, you think of fall. And oftentimes when you think of fall, people like to drink red wine. But I'm gonna tell you two options you can do with this. You can do uh, the nice, uh, pretty, soft um, Chardonnay that is not overly oak Chardonnay. Uh, you can do a new world Chardonnay, like a California Chardonnay or South America Chardonnay that it's not fermented in oak. 
So an oak chardonnay would work well for white mm. with this. We want to do a red. We can do a nice um, light style, uh, possibly a cabernet, a fruity cabernet. Mm -hmm. um, again, an oaked. Uh, Cabernet, or we can also uh, do a nice uh, Zinfandel for the oh, fall. Oh, my favorite. A red Zinfandel, there is three types of Zinfandels. There is a, a pretty nice Zinfandel that resembles of the Beaujolais, very fruity. Mm -hmm. There is that old vine Zinfandel that comes from a cooler climate that has that peppery, spicy, those are a little bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And there is the old vine Zinfandels are very earthy and very tannic. Mm -hmm. So we want to choose the first style of Zinfandel. Usually right. those come from Amador County. And um, uh, and very County, pretty in, in California. California and, and it's very pretty uh, very have very rustic characteristics to it that would work really well with this too uh, mm -hmm. again a nice light Pinot Noir would work with this as well yeah. I love all those Zins yeah. <laughs> that's absolutely my favorite wine okay now we have the cauliflower puree again mm -hmm. paired with salmon mm -hmm. and I've just dipped this in egg covered it with Parmesan and baked it in the oven for about 15 minutes until mm -hmm. it just flaked and then we have a little bit of kale on the side, which I didn't do this, but I would put just a little olive oil and salt mm -hmm. and pepper on that. We used to pay people to eat kale. Today, kale is the star, <laughs> star uh, <laughs> lettuce green in any dish in there. And uh, well, we look at salmon. Here's again, salmon is the main component in this dish. And salmon is one type of fish that is considered a strong fish. It has certain oils on it that you need to think carefully of the wine. Oftentimes, we look right away, we go for a Chardonnay. The best way to pair with salmon is a Riesling, whether it's a New World Riesling or an Old World Riesling. An Old World Riesling that comes from Alsace or Germany, a New World Riesling that would come from California or would come from Oregon. Uh, a reason I say Riesling, especially if you char Pinot Noir on the grill in the summer, you can actually serve it with a Pinot Noir, a red wine. Yeah. And people always hear... say red wine with fish, you know, that's uh -huh. of course. Especially when you do a grilled tuna, which is the steaks of the sea in there, you can also serve a red wine with that. Pinot Noir, when you char grill it, prepare it in a certain way, would work with Pinot Noir. In this way, I would prepare it with a white wine. I would serve it with a white wine, and, and, and be, my choice would be a Riesling. Yeah. And we, we actually got a great one here that we pulled out of uh, your husband's wine cellar okay. in there. <laughs> and uh, we had a Riesling from our, our guy, and this is from Oregon, a New World style. Uh, a cool climate that would offer sufficient um, acidity to work with this and it would be a great complement without breaking the budget. Hmm. Uh, uh. I'm shocked because I would have served a Pinot Noir and a Chardonnay because of the weight of the food. Pinot Noir would, would work but yeah. I would not, the Chardonnay would just kind of be slightly off with this. Okay, you know? oh, I learned something new. All right, this is something special to me because I prepared this with some mm -hmm. Latvian chili oil mm -hmm. that a Latvian friend of mine gave me. She said you can get it at Papa Joe's, but I want you to know mine is from Latvia. Mm -hmm. So I, this is a, a very spicy oil, and that's why the chop has this beautiful color. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't add too much spice, just kind of medium spice, and I've served that with a little buttered sweet potato. Mm, interesting. Uh, spicy food, we look at spicy as a texture. Every time we look at pairing food on wine, there's three things we need to keep in mind. We need components, flavors, and textures. Uh, when I look at spicy food, it's always a texture. When I have spicy the way I want to cure uh, spices in my food, uh, drinking water or eating a piece of bread, mm -hmm. of course we prefer a piece of bread because it scrapes your tongue, because the mm. spices kind of coat your tongue. So in this case in here, I want a wine that has tannins that mm. earthy tannins that people sometimes try to avoid. Why is earthy tannins? Because it's a texture that's gonna scrape your mouth. So mm. the, te the texture, the tannins, would cancel the spices of the food. They cannot act like an eraser. So that's my first choice because I'm looking at the spicy food and now I'm gonna have focus on a spicy food and what I'm gonna pair mm -hmm. with wine. Great. And in this case, I will pick, like we went to the cellar and picked some nice old world style Rioja. Mm -hmm. Rioja offers that dusty, dry earthness of the wine that would work really well with this mm -hmm. uh, from Amuga. And um, that's one option. Another option is I can pick an earthy wine that offers bright fruits that would kind of coincide with the spicy food on the red, like we talked about mm -hmm. old world Granacha, Granacha, old mm -hmm. vines. That would work really well. It becomes, an, because Riojas are a little bit more expensive, so the Garnacha will offer an inexpensive choice. If I want it white, someone doesn't drink red, there's mm -hmm. also an option. I can do a nice Gewürztraminer, which offers a sweet aftertaste because nothing confines, the, the, you know, can counter the spiciness, mm. but the sweetness of the You're wine. You're in love with Gewürztraminer. So that's <laughs> also, a uh, Gewürztraminer would offset the spices of the uh, dish. So that's the uh, two options for white and red. Okay, and you know, I always have to 
throw something Mexican out there. Okay. So this is actually from a new restaurant mm -hmm. that uh, has just come into Bloomfield, and it's called Mex. Mex, I've been And there. these Great are food. their, grapefruit, yeah. Mm -hmm. These are their chicken fajitas, and the portions are so large, I ate half mm -hmm. of this for my lunch yesterday, and I brought the other half home. Mm -hmm. And they serve it with a little bit of sour cream or creme fraiche, some lettuce, and some tomatoes, and a little bit of cheese, which I've just kind of mixed together here. Mm -hmm. And then some warm tortillas. Mm -hmm. So what would you pair with this? You know, I'm thinking, was it spicy? I haven't tasted it. I didn't order that last this time I was there. It was very spicy. It was very spicy. Right. Again, if we, we have it spicy, uh, I, I would go with the same thing what we treated the spicy food in here. Okay. Uh, I would use, actually, I would not use a Rioja, and oppose I'll stick with the garnacha. Oh, okay. In there, which is a Grenache in France, uh -huh. uh, that style would work really nicely, especially if it has a uh, some Grenache has a sweet aftertaste to it. Would would complement this very well. What about a Spanish wine with this? Um, Since they, we're they, talking about going no, back yeah, to the yeah, the old Garnacha from Catalonia, oh, from okay, the Catalonia right. region. Uh, uh -huh. I would. Uh, that's basically what I would pick for this. Does you know? it change your mind at all to know there's spinach in there? Uh, spinach? No, not at all. And that okay. in the Garnacha would work uh, well with this. Okay. You know? All right, let's move this aside. And last but not least, we have our dessert. Oh. And what I've made here is something you've never seen before <laughs> because mm, I just made this up. This is a hazelnut creme brulee. And I say brulee lightly because we're not going to brulee it. Mm -hmm. If you, I serve it either just like it is. It's got lots of hazelnuts in it, and it's mm -hmm. made with non-dairy hazelnut cream okay. and also regular cream. So it's still, it's so still how very creamy. It this is not that sweet okay. unless you put the topping on. Okay. And the topping is a very sweet coconut, toasted coconut. Oh, okay. So would you would that change <coughs> your mind served either way? No, in, in desserts, the one thing is I would forget about the components. I would forget about the uh, flavors for a minute because the most important component we worry about is texture. Uh, let's say, for example, I'm serving a, I have a dinner party and you serve three or four courses and we look at the richness of the courses. We started with something light, we mm -hmm. served a rich wine. We start with something light, then we go to a rich wine. Mm -hmm. And then we play that texture off and on. If the course that follows this was a rich course and we had a big wine, let's say we had an Asapuco, we the had a bottle of Barolo, it. yeah. Mm -hmm. The main course, we had an Asapuco, we had a nice bottle of Barolo, two rich items, rich plate, rich wine in there, then mm -hmm. comes to this. Well, the classic, Cream brulee, cream brulee is a sauterne, but sauterne is rich. Mm -hmm. And um, then I would look to serve something light, like a Moscato di Asti from, okay. from, from Italy. Almost and like an opera. A sparkling uh, Italian wine, almost. it becomes like a light, refreshing way to end the meal in mm -hmm. there. So that's what I will do. If it was a lighter course before and a lighter wine, then I will go with a sauterne to pair with this. Oh, or go with a, an Alsatian uh, dessert style wine. They're made mm -hmm. from the same grape called Vendage Tardive. Okay. There. That's a dessert style wine. Great. There. So it wouldn't change your mind at all if you had this sweetened coconut or not? Not at all, because we can play that texture again. We can serve a drier style Riesling. Mm -hmm. uh, it would work fine and, and with this because it's not as sweet. Even the sweeter style would, since it's not too sweet, it would be too cloy sweet. You know, you yeah, have that right. sweet and sweet that. don't work well together. Right. So and there's a rule, right, that the wine should be sweeter than the... Exactly, and, and that, that's that's a preference when we say, how do you know that? Well, whenever you have a dessert, people right away ask for coffee because that bitterness of the coffee is oh. going to contrast the sweetness of the desserts because people like those components together. Mm -hmm. If I asked you for a, uh, for example, you had a brownie, hot fudge brownie, which would you prefer, an orange juice or a milk? Most mm -hmm. people would say milk, milk. because it cleanses <laughs> you, Pala, with yeah, that. Why do we know this orange juice? Because it, yeah. we know right away that sweet mm -hmm. and sweet, they don't taste well together. Same thing we have to apply here mm -hmm. with the wine. Uh, if, if this is too sweet, I don't want my wine to be way too sweet. For example, people right. make a mistake. There are syrupy sweet wines, like a wine from France uh, called a Muscat de Bon de Vigny. Those Muscat style wines, they're made, mm -hmm. they don't have any acidity. They're made like very syrupy style. Mm -hmm. That would be way too much for this. I so see. I would want something that would, would bring the nice acidity, refreshing acidity. Okay, to we've thrown a lot at you today from A to Z here, from appetizer to dessert. Thank you, Nadal. I appreciate My your pleasure. coming. My pleasure. Thank you. This was very informative. You can watch it again on the Bloomfield Cable channel um, on their website. And you can also watch it on my YouTube channel again if you want to hear all this great information that Nadal has told you. I'm Chef Lynn. Enjoy.